I'm in China to try to answer a question that could determine the fate of our planet. I hear China burns more coal than any other country, and that coal is the biggest contributor to climate change. It's making some Americans I know wonder why we should take climate change seriously if China isn't. But I've also heard a different story, that these days China is taking huge steps to reduce carbon emissions and keep the planet from melting. Which is it? I'm here to find out. It's no secret that the pollution here, caused mainly by the burning of coal, has been horrible for decades. But I didn't realize how bad. The images at this art exhibit are arresting. Do you like these? You like that one? You know what these are. It's medicine. They're all medicine bottles for coffee or lung issue. Like this one is for kids. Yeah. yeah. I meet a family who recently left Beijing. They tell me the pollution was making their son sick. So do you think you'll go back to Beijing? We love Beijing. Yeah. And all my family is still there. But he won't be able to go to school because he's got some lung issues. Uh -huh. And how many days of school do you think he had to miss? One to two days per one, week? One, one or two. Mm. So you actually had to keep him home one or two days a week? Yeah. Also, one or two times a month, he needs to go to the hospital for treatment. It's unbelievable. Zachary. How are you sure your mask in Beijing, Dad? A special mask. Oh, my goodness. When he was playing at home, even, that he has to actually wear. Really? Is that you? Yes. So do you like it here in Hong Kong? Yes. Yeah? Because? Because, because. Because you don't have to wear one of these. Because you can go yes. to school? <laughs> That's more fun, right? I'm surprised to hear Zachary's family hopes to return to Beijing sometime soon. Their friends say the air quality is improving. Is this wishful thinking? Or is the air getting better because China is overcoming its reliance on coal? When I'm not busy acting on television, I'm a passionate advocate for a number of issues, especially climate change. I've come to Chicago to learn more about a fight brewing between Big Coal and the country's largest environmental group, the Sierra Club and their Beyond Coal campaign. Christine Nanicelli is right in the middle of it. Why was this a place that Sierra Club came to? Illinois is a coal state. In a lot of ways, this has been ground zero. Christine says that even though coal is on the decline, due to the skyrocketing use of wind, solar, and cheap natural gas, the U.S. is still second only to China in the amount of coal it burns. Which is why the campaign is trying to close as many plants as it can. Coal pollution threatens things that we all care about. Since 2010, over a third of the coal plants in the nation have closed or are about to. Hundreds of workers are going to be out of a job. But Big Coal and its backers are fighting back hard. The Supreme Court has temporarily blocked the administration's clean power plan. 29 states are suing over the plan, which limits greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. Christine is meeting with the leaders of the Beyond Coal campaign in Chicago to figure out what comes next. These are the plants that we have to get announced to retire. This could be a map that doesn't change much over the next few years. If the coal industry has their way, this is where we're going to stop. Illinois is one of the top five coal mining states, and it has a lot of coal-fired power plants. So getting Illinois right is critical to our overall success. One of the big players here is obviously NRG. Let's talk about them. So we're hearing that the company is trying to squeeze as much money out of these coal plants before they have to retire them, which may be decades away. What are we going to do about that? Everything is on the line. People's lives are on the line. The climate is on the line. Do you think we have a strategy here? We do. We do. And a Huntley plan. If the Sierra Club is going to take on NRG, they've got their work cut out for them. NRG Energy is a massive company with a presence in 22 states. It is one of the biggest burners of fossil fuels in the nation, thanks in part to its large fleet of coal plants including one that is nearly a century old in a city on Lake Michigan called Waukegan. Wow. Energy bought this coal plant in 2014. That recently? That recently. You know, while they have made some upgrades, even with those bare minimum controls that they installed, it's still the largest source of air and water pollution in the entire county. 
it just doesn't make sense to me to invest in something that seems old and dying and not instead invest in other kinds of energy. Unfortunately, that kind of a business model leaves communities like Waukegan basically being held hostage. So what would it mean for the Beyond Coal campaign to succeed here in Waukegan? If we can do it here in the industrial heartland against one of the largest energy companies in, in the country, we can do it anywhere. Some of the worst air pollution in the world has blanketed China for years, and the international media has been all over it. This is what everybody in Beijing is talking about today, this gray pool of smoggy stuff that's just hanging over the city. A report published in the Lancet Medical Journal says that air pollution in China is responsible for between 350,000 to 500,000 premature deaths every year. Chinese officials insist the murky air over Beijing this month is just fog, but measurements taken at the U.S. Embassy there show dangerously high levels of air pollution. We were all warned before we went to, to Beijing about the air quality, but once you arrive and you actually see it, you sense it, you breathe it, and it really hits you uh, like a brick. Former U.S. Ambassador Gary Locke tells me the embassy had been uploading daily air quality readings from the monitors on its roof, but the U.S. numbers conflicted with official Chinese reports. That's when the people on the internet, the Chinese citizens say, hey, what gives? How come the United States government says it's really hazardous and the Chinese government is downplaying it? Did they try to block the information at first? A lot of influential bloggers, some with millions of followers, they were being pressured to not basically retweet the readings that we gave out. What kind of signals were you getting from the Chinese government? They asked us to stop and desist and to not set up the program or to uh, shut it down, and we said no. At a certain point, the government must have change their attitude. We're breathing the same air. That's right. The turning point was in January of 2013. We had almost three weeks of hazardous air. Uh, it was so bad that you could not even see across the street. And finally, the Chinese government acknowledged this was severe air pollution. Uh, they could not hide it anymore, that there needed to be action by the Chinese government. And do you feel that this was a turning point in the way that the Chinese government started to approach climate change? This is like the genie that's been let out of the bottle. Uh, there's more concern over environmental issues every single day. But I do believe that the attention on air pollution, and thanks to the efforts of the embassy, galvanized mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese opinion and concern mm -hmm. over air pollution, and therefore greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore climate change. Chinese social media sites exploded. Protests sprang up against polluting factories. In 2013, the government, under pressure to clean up the air, started moving coal plants away from cities to rural areas. A year later, the government took things even further. Those concerned about climate change are calling this the breakthrough they've been waiting for, a deal brokered between the US and China to greatly reduce carbon emissions. This is an ambitious goal, but it is an achievable goal. China may not be a democracy, but when smog made life unbearable for its people, the government finally acted. What is this community like? 70% are Latino and African American. It's a working class community. How hard is it to get people in a town like this motivated to take on something this big? There are amazing people that I have met here that maybe have not ever been a part of a campaign in their lives, have never spoken publicly, have never knocked on doors, and they're doing it. 
it's almost like everyday people have to learn how to be activists. Absolutely. Christine says that while a big part of the Beyond Coal strategy is to encourage locals to lead the charge, talking only about climate change isn't enough. In this community, the potential health impacts are more of a concern. And Christine says I'll understand why if I meet Dulce Ortiz, who lives and works downtown just a stone's throw from the coal plant. Wow. Oh, wow. It's right outside your window, huh? Yes, it is. What's that like? It's frustrating and inspiring, but mostly frustrating. <laughs> Dulce tells me she's worried about the health impact the pollution from the plant might have on her 14-year-old son, Ivan, and her mother, Sonia, who also lives in town. So what are some of the personal impacts that the coal plant has had on you guys? I um, have uh, problems with my lungs constantly. You know, I never in my life smoke. Mm -hmm. And it's not just me. She's starting getting sick, too. You've developed similar issues? Yes. Is this something that is more widespread in the community, or is this just your family? No, it's, it's in the community, you know? It's bad. Of course, we can't say that asthma is caused by the coal plant, but the pollution that's being put out into the air creates the asthma attacks. Dulce explains that such attacks are common in Waukegan. One study found that one in three school children had asthma or asthma-like symptoms, a rate far higher than in the rest of the state. But before meeting Christine, Dulce didn't even realize what the plant outside her window was. You didn't know there was no, a plant? No, I did not know. You know, I told Christine, you know, what can I do? What do you want me to do? Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So Dulce and other locals learned the power of going door to door, telling residents about the risks of the plant. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Dosartis. I'm Anisha Blake. I'm also here with Clean Power. And this is Jordan. Hey, Jordan. <laughs> um, do you have any children? Yeah, I got three of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, so that's why we're doing this work. There is a, a coal plant less than a mile away from your home. Our children should have a clean air. They should have a clean environment. Yeah, I don't mind sign. You know, that's a good thing. Yeah. After collecting signatures for a petition, this group of everyday citizens organized to get more than 150 residents to march on the coal plant. We ask that NRG come to the table to transition away from coal. Then just before Christmas, they took their petitions directly to the mayor and town council, demanding that the city come up with a plan to retire the coal plant and attract cleaner, greener jobs. That's what our community, more than 2,000 residents, ask of you, Mayor Motley, and the members of the city council. The activists delivered the 2,000 petitions and asked Mayor Wayne Motley to set up a meeting with NRG. If I can't arrange that meeting, which I told you I would, yes. I will certainly do that. Thank you so much. OK. Yes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I'll just pray. I'll just pray. <laughs> So what was the response to delivering the 2,000 peti petitions to the mayor? Nothing has come of that. And does the mayor think that conversation should happen? I don't know what the mayor thinks. We haven't heard from him. We don't know what his plans are. With no response from NRG or their local government, the activists are stuck. So I'm going to meet the mayor to find out where he stands. China has changed a lot since I first came here in the late 70s. What used to be sleepy villages are now thriving megacities. Back then, China's most valued asset was cheap labor. And so they became a factory to the world, growing their economy 70-fold in less than four decades. Think about that. Nothing like it has happened before in the history of mankind. To power it all, China built more than a thousand coal plants, which contribute to an energy sector that pumps out an astounding 20% of the gases warming the planet. I like this one. Try it. Nice. That looks Is nice on you. Yes? Yeah. Looks nice on you. Were you born in China? Kevin Mo is a top climate advisor to the American and Chinese governments. 
He came down from Beijing to meet with me. In the Walmart, a lot of made in China stuff, exactly like here. That's why they're saying this is a factory of the world. Yeah. That's what China becomes now. He tells me if China's going to quit coal, it will have to pivot away from so much reliance on manufacturing and dirty industry. So how will the economy have to adjust? How will it change? Well, now you have to transition to service-based economy, which is finance, finance, IT, okay. insurance, those kind of things. Not like energy intensified yes. industries like steel, cement, those kind of things. So it's different. So if they can make that transition. If they can make that transition, the economic growth will be more sustainable and consume less energy, but generate more revenues. In your opinion, can they do it? And can well, they do it as fast as they hope to? Well, let's say this. If China doesn't make all these changes and still use the previous growth model, economic growth model, then the scenario would be, by 2050, China's carbon emissions would be more than the current total carbon emissions in the world. That much carbon dioxide in the air would make life on Earth unbearable. But Kevin claims China's leaders acknowledge this threat and are making plans to ensure that doesn't happen. The problem is that if China shifts away from manufacturing, other countries, including ones that burn lots of coal, will be picking up the slack. And so the benefit to the climate is unclear. Today, I'm meeting the mayor of Waukegan, who said he would set up a meeting between the plant owner, NRG, and the local group leading the fight, called Clean Power Lake County. What is your take on, on, these, uh, on this group and what they're trying to do? I think that they have every right to do what they're doing. But one thing that people have to realize is I have a business in my community that pays almost a million dollars a year in taxes, mm -hmm. provides a uh, hundred skilled jobs. Should that business close, where would I get that revenue from? How could I balance my budgets? I, I happen to have a very good working relation with NRG. They're just not prepared to discuss any future dealings with the uh, plant. Do you think that Clean Power Lake County speaks for the majority of residents and how they feel about the coal plant? Because they recently delivered 2,000 petitions. I guess what you really have to look into and understand is how they acquired those signatures and what pretense they used to get them. The people I talked to didn't know what they were signing, so I don't know what to tell you. NRG has a huge millions and millions of dollar investment in this. Clean Power Lake County has no financial investment, nor does Sierra Club. I think that they would argue that their investment may not be a financial one, but their investment is their health and the future of their hometown. I'm not saying one mayor's more than the other. But you have heard from residents of Waukegan that they themselves experience uh, health impacts, namely asthma. I've had no list of people or a line of people coming into my office complaining about those issues. Isn't it the duty of elected officials to have those people's voices get heard? I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. And believe me, America, I've tried to be neutral to this whole process, but over the last 20 years, we've lost probably 30,000 jobs on our lakefront. Should the yeah. coal plant close? It's a real dilemma. I mean, it's a dilemma for me. I get where the mayor is coming from. Waukegan did once employ tens of thousands in factories on its waterfront, but those factories closed and left behind a legacy of toxic pollution that's still being cleaned up. The coal plant is virtually all that remains of that industrial past. I go back to Dulce's to tell her what Mayor Motley said. Interesting. I wish I had better news. His response was that he couldn't be sure that those 2,000 uh, signatures were legitimate or whether or not the people knew what they were signing. So personally, I'm frustrated, so I can't imagine. How do you right. feel? For him to say that these people didn't know uh, what they were si signing, I, I find that very, uh, how can I say, it? very disturbing. 
and um, he's completely wrong. Waukegan has five Superfund sites, so there is a trail of corporations polluting our lands, taking their profits, and just leaving, and leaving us the residents with the health issues and no opportunity for economic development. We don't want that to happen again, and it's difficult that he's not understanding, you know, what we're trying to do here. Tell me what that was like to be the first here. It was a little bit odd. I felt like a pioneer in the beginning. Barbara Finnamore is an energy expert who's been helping China find ways to get off coal since the early 90s. There was almost no awareness at the time of climate change, and there was no awareness of the need to use energy more efficiently. But China really is the key to the future of our planet, right? The fact of the matter is, things are changing very fast here. As part of its agreement with the U.S., China pledged to get 20% of its energy from non-fossil fuels by 2030. And Barbara says this plant that powers Hong Kong Island is representative of what's happening all across China. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Hi. Mr. Wen. Sigourney Weaver. Nice meeting you. Nice to meeting us is the managing director of Hong Kong Electric, C.T. Wen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This power station started in 1979, originally from oil to coal, but now because of the climate change agenda, we'll eventually get rid of all the coal towards the end of the next decade. Really? Yes. Science tells us that we need to do something before it's too late. Mm -hmm. So the minimum thing we need to do is to reduce carbon emission. And we decided to build 8,600 solar panels now. Sometimes in America, the people who are running these coal plants say, well, you know, we're not so sure that what we're experiencing is, is because of climate change. Uh, I'm an engineer by training. You know, we, we only look at data and facts. Mm. You know, those prove that it is coming. And we need to do something, you know, other, otherwise too late. And do you feel that China will make its commitments in terms of lowering fossil fuels? Are you optimistic? Last year, is a real turning point in China. The total investment in renewable power generation is more than conventional power. It's the first time in history. This speaks for itself. CT takes us on a tour of the plant. OK, sit tight. OK. Don't be a speed demon. Not only is China making enormous investments in green energy, this year, the government halted construction on 30 coal power plants with a capacity greater than Britain's entire coal fleet. Even more important, I'm surprised to hear, two years ago, coal consumption in China leveled off and is actually going down. Here we are. Quite extraordinary. This is quite extraordinary. This is the perfect place to talk to you because you have the past, the coal, and the future. This amazing solar array. Five years ago, there was virtually no solar power in China. Really? And by 2030, China will have added as much wind and solar as exist in the world today. Are you kidding me? Last year was huge for renewables here. China now has more solar power than any other country, and it's installed almost half of the world's new wind turbines. All in all, China spent more than $100 billion on renewables last year and became the world's top investor in clean energy. In Waukegan, Dulce and the other volunteers have been dealt a setback. The plant's owner, NRG, isn't willing to meet with them. So they're gathering to plot their next move. There are some who ask, well, if you don't like it, then why don't you move? Well, because we, have, we own homes here, because our families are here, because our jobs are here. And just because something isn't right doesn't mean you walk away from it. You try to fix it. And that's what we're trying to do, is make it better for everybody. With this campaign, 
You know, we're trying to say, we're here, we're gonna fight for you, we're gonna be your voice, and we're gonna put pressure on every single person that has right. anything to do with that coal plant. So, you've tried City Hall, you've tried the mayor. What is the next level? We need to get people in a bus down to Springfield. We need to show their citizens are behind them. Let's put some passion into this the next few months and get it going. As I look around at the people here, I realize how remarkable it is. A pastor, a nun, a college grad coming home, regular people coming together to fight this fight. And it's clear they're not giving up. Here we go. The Waukeganites have decided to take the fight to Springfield, the capital of Illinois. They're joining forces with people from across the state to lobby their representatives to support the Illinois Clean Jobs Bill, which would create incentives to bring new, clean energy jobs to communities like Waukegan. Get on the left side of the bus. Don't miss this wind park. That's what clean energy looks like. Dulce and the rest of the activists are making the four-hour journey in the hopes that passing this clean jobs legislation will put pressure on their mayor and NRG to start talking with them about a transition away from dirty energy. What do we want? Clean jobs! What do we want? Now! What do we want? Clean jobs! What do we want? Now! I come here with one clear message today. Communities like Waukegan deserve a clean energy future, and it's time to finally pass the Illinois Clean Jobs Bill. In addition to lobbying the governor, the activists spend the entire day pressing their case with every state legislator they can find. They are hoping their local representative, Rita Mayfield, will sign on to a letter calling on NRG to meet with them. But she's declining to do so. She's not gonna sign until she feels there's a united front. I, I just feel frustrated. Yeah, oh, we didn't me too. With that. Me too. At the end of the session, they're not much further along than when they started. The clean jobs bill is in legislative limbo, and their local officials seem reluctant to sign on to their letter to NRG. The effort to get coal out of Waukegan is faltering. The transformation in China has been truly remarkable, bringing more people out of poverty than any other time in human history. Dan Dudek witnessed that transformation firsthand. For more than two decades, he's been working with the Chinese on their pollution problems. The Chinese government asked Dan to help them reduce emissions by getting polluters to pay for the CO2 they spew into the atmosphere. It's called cap and trade. Today, he's invited me out to Hong Kong's Victoria Harbor to explain exactly what that means. I'll do my best. We have a fabulous backdrop for that yes. here on the Hong Kong skyline. Imagine that each building is an emission source, and the height of each building is the level of its annual emissions. So, for example, the tall one might be very old, traditional coal-fired power plants. A shorter building would be natural gas, which has a lot less in the way of carbon content than coal does. Okay, so if the tall building is the heavy polluter and the little building is the low polluter, how do they work together to decrease the emissions? Well, the government's going to set a limit, a maximum level in terms of total emissions. And we can imagine that as a line drawn across all of these buildings. Dan tells me this line, or cap, is the amount of pollution the government is willing to tolerate. To avoid a steep penalty, companies above this line must pollute less or buy credits from the companies below the line. Then, over time, the cap gets lowered, allowing less carbon pollution and making credits more expensive. So over time, as the level of emissions drops, they'll have to switch over to cleaner energy, Absolutely. right? With a market like this, what we're going to do is stimulate innovation. People are going to come up with new ideas. In fact, the race toward the future it's going to be about the 
global clean energy economy. And I think China is a lot more prepared for that than the United States is. If Dan seems pessimistic about the U.S., it's because President Obama tried to pass a national cap and trade bill seven years ago, but it died in Congress. When I think about the future and, you know, my real anxieties, it's probably as much about what the United States won't do as what China will do. And now there's little hope that a similar bill would even surface in a Trump presidency. Still, China is planning to roll out a nationwide cap and trade program next year. After months of trying, Waukegan has been unable to bring NRG to the table to discuss the future of its coal plant. And then I see that in the middle of their fight, the company CEO, David Crane, was fired. He was supposed to have been very progressive. That's right. Well, it's a company in transformation fuel. Trying to turn a brown company green. Fossil fuel and clean energy future. Believing a big fossil fuel energy company could transform itself into a clean energy leader. I want to ask him, why won't NRG let go of coal? I was trying to transform energy from being a fossil fuel-based electricity company into a renewable-based energy company. And we were moving in that direction. If I had been a person that had kept my head down and never talked about these issues, mm -hmm. um, then I think I would still be in the job. So then why did you get fired? Because uh, what you were trying to do failed? I, I would not say that what I had done had failed. And uh, I would say, probably that it hadn't uh, succeeded yet. Uh -huh. yeah. um, when you were the CEO, NRG bought a coal plant in Waukegan, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Why did NRG buy that plant? So we bought that plant as part of a much larger acquisition because the portfolio of power plants we bought had a very valuable set of wind farms and four coal plants in Illinois outside of Chicago. So to get the wind farms, you had to buy the coal yes. plants? Yes probably should have just sold the coal plants the minute we bought them because there's no future in uh, coal in the United States. Do you still believe that, that coal is on its way out? Oh, coal is very much on its way out. In the United States, coal has stage four cancer. I would suggest to you that there's not a single coal-fired power plant in the United States that's making money today. So is what you're saying to me that NRG is keeping the plant in Waukegan open in case coal makes a comeback? Uh, yes. And you're hoping that at some point prices turn around and then you can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been to Waukegan. Oh, you have? And I met with a woman named Dulce Ortiz, who she herself has developed asthma. Her mother has developed asthma. My, my question is, do the people inside of a company like NRG ever stop to think about the Dulces? No business allows itself to be uh, stymied by, you know, by just some people, you know, living near something uh, like that. NRG just invested $100 million in environmental controls on the Waukegan plant. I mean, within the last year. And when a company spends $100 million, they don't want to close it, you know, the next year. So then looking forward, you know, is it possible to move these huge companies that exist from, you know, a brown industry into a green industry? Your question is an unbelievably important question that nobody is asking. I'm not confident that fossil fuel energy companies will lead the clean energy revolution. And unfortunately, the lesson of what happened to me is, is, is not going to be encouragement for anyone who wants to radically change what their company is doing. Based on what David's telling me, getting NRG's new CEO, Mauricio Gutierrez, to come to the table seems unlikely. He declined to talk to me, but the Waukegan activists say they might have come up with a way to confront him directly. Now that China is about to unveil a national cap and trade program, making companies pay a price for carbon emissions, I imagine utility executives here will be up in arms. It turns out there's a big time energy executive who welcomes action on climate, 
Richard Lancaster is CEO of China Light and Power, one of the largest independent energy companies in China, which for decades has relied on coal to generate profits. We identified quite early on that climate change is a risk that we had to really bring into our thinking in the business. We had to really adopt the scientific targets that said the electricity industry as a whole had to reduce its carbon intensity by 75% or more by the year 2050 mm -hmm. if global temperatures w were to be stabilized. David Crane uh, was running NRG and he also shifted his company, or tried to, from brown to green. And in the end, uh, the company balked and he got fired. So how have you been able to manage this transition so successfully? The strongest argument I have is the risks that this business would be facing if we don't make that shift. But the reality is that we are where we are today. We have built coal-fired power stations, we've built fossil fuel power stations, we run our economies on energy, and all of that infrastructure has been built. Had we known what we do today, we may have made different decisions earlier, but we now need to accept that this is an urgent problem and work as quickly as we can. China said it's gonna go ahead and put a price on carbon. That's what you mean when you say there are risks to uh, the coal power business. It might sound strange, but I actually welcome the clarity of having a price on carbon, and it actually makes our job a lot easier. If you recognize that carbon emissions, they bring about climate change and there is a cost for that, mm -hmm. then that represents then a risk for us if we're making investments in coal-fired power. Knowing that there is a price makes our job of persuading our shareholders and government policymakers that this is a sensible choice to go for renewable energy rather than coal. So, for the sake of argument, pretend that I am, I am a dissatisfied board member. You want to move away from coal into renewables. And I say, Richard, it's too expensive. I want my monthly dividends. Uh, I'm against this. What do you say to me? Renewable energy is affordable. It comes with support from governments. It comes with subsidies to close that gap. And if we're not taking advantage of that, then we're not acting in the longer term interests of our business. So can you guarantee to me that it will be as profitable as the coal power business? I can't guarantee that it will be as profitable as coal today, but I can say that in the future, renewable energy will be far more profitable than coal. Renewables will be more profitable than coal? Well, that's good news. To confront NRG's new CEO, Mauricio Gutierrez, Dulce and the rest of the activists have hatched a clever plan. They've become shareholders of NRG stock so they can attend today's annual meeting. We should definitely um, be expecting the CEO, Mr. Gutierrez, um, to respond to our question. Do you think he's going to come to Waukegan? I'll be very surprised if he himself actually comes, <coughs> which is what we need. This is nerve-wracking, but it's critical to remember we have a right as shareholders to be there. Our voices deserve to be heard, so go in there and tell your story. I think we should all at least practice part of our speech, not the whole thing, just so that we don't get too nervous. Thank you, President Gutierrez and members of the board for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Dulce Ortiz, and I am a proud resident of Waukegan, Illinois, where one of your many coal plants resides. I am here representing my community Your Waukegan Coal Plant Powerless is County. the biggest air polluter in my county and is responsible for over 55% of all toxic releases. Even with your new controls, the plant is still by far the largest source of air and water pollution in the entire county and our community continues to suffer. One in three children in Waukegan have asthma or are undiagnosed with asthma symptoms. It damages my health, the health of my children and the health of all residents of Waukegan. Continuing to do the minimum is not 
effective leadership, you must do more. I have a lot of pride in my hometown, and that's why I traveled 800 miles as a representative of the up-and-coming young people in Waukegan. Mr. Gutierrez, Waukeganites are counting on you to come to Waukegan and work with us to develop a transition plan for the coal plant. Will you do it? We cannot wait any longer. The shareholders meeting lasted only 45 minutes, but everyone was able to make their speech. And the CEO, Mauricio Gutierrez, was listening. After I spoke to him, even though he didn't give us a date, he mentioned it, that he will be going to Waukegan. As soon as he, he has some time, he will visit Waukegan. I really think this may, may be a pivot point in our relationship with them. Where do we want to be in a year? Do we want to be coming back here? No, oh, no, absolutely not. I do not want to be here because it's ridiculous that we have to come here. All of us here have made sacrifices away from our friends, away from our families, taking time off work that some of us don't have the luxury to take the time off. So, no, I don't want to be here. We've got to keep the issue at the forefront of every elected official's minds moving forward and make sure he comes to Waukegan and move this forward. The activists' persistence has paid off. They were able to get the CEO's attention. But after all their time and effort, I'm beginning to wonder if they will ever be able to close the coal plant. So I traveled to New York City to meet the man who's funded the Beyond Coal campaign to the tune of $80 million. And some call this progress a war on coal. Uh, the truth is that coal is waging a war on American lives. Michael Bloomberg has been a fierce advocate for reducing carbon emissions as mayor of New York City and as a philanthropist. I want to ask him, how can a campaign like the one in Waukegan be successful? So I went to Waukegan, and they're, they're having trouble. They're, the NRG, the company that owns the coal plant in Waukegan, they have no intention of closing the coal plant. Um, so they've hit a wall there. Just think about this. In the United States, 14,000 deaths were uh, attributed every year to coal-fired power plants. That is now down to roughly 7,000 deaths. Oh, wow. So 7,000 people are living because we reduced the use of coal in this country. Not only that, but America reduced its greenhouse gases in the last 10 years, and we've reduced them dramatically. Why? The public is picketing the power plants, and elected officials are coming around because their constituents are saying, do something about it. What is it really going to take for us to stop burning coal? Governments exist with the will of the majority of the people. And I'm telling you, if you complain, they will do something about it. So will the owners of the coal-fired power plants. That's what's happening. So then do you think your investment has been worth it? Has it been successful? Well, yes. From my personal point of view, what better thing could I do for my children? Can you, you want to go home and say to your kids, you know, daddy could have made your life and your children's lives better and healthier, but he didn't want to spend the money. Mm. I don't think I want to have that conversation with my kids. I don't think you want to have it with yours. So how long are you committed to fighting this fight? Until it's won. China and the U.S. have ratified the Paris Climate Agreement. This is not a fight that any one country, no matter how powerful, can take alone. But now it's up to each partner to live up to its end of the bargain. I sit down with one of the key figures responsible for the U.S.-China partnership, Obama's former climate advisor, John Podesta. And joining us is Orville Schell, one of the world's leading experts on U.S.-China relations. I found it very refreshing to be in a country where everyone agreed that climate change was real, but there seems to be tremendous pressure in China to keep economic progress rolling along. Can we trust them to do what they say they're going to do? There's always the question of uh, if in an economy that's slowing down, will they uh, continue that commitment? They don't make idle 
public commitments. Right. This was done mm. at the standing committee level, endorsed by the People's Congress. They don't do that unless they mean it. The entire fundament of the Chinese Communist Party's rule is on delivering economically. So if push comes to shove, we're going to run into a lot of problems. I think that's why we have to constantly monitor and verify that the actions are taking place. Even in that context, uh, their growth is going to be in clean energy, making it ever more cheaper to shift uh, to clean energy sources. That'll help us. That'll help people all around the world uh, as these two gigantic economies move forward uh, in unison to decarbonize. China is not going to move on climate if the U.S. doesn't. And the U.S. is not going to move if China doesn't. So we're in this kind of strange, you know... Minuet. We're, we're, we're married. Yeah. yeah. We wanted ambition from, the, from mm -hmm. China. They wanted to see real commitment uh, from the United States. And I think we're headed in the right direction. We just need to accelerate the pace of, of okay. movement. Lots of Chinese would agree with that. Back in Hong Kong, where people are more free to speak openly, they're doing just that. Of course, the government should be doing a lot of things, but they are not doing enough. We as citizens, we have to stand up, make our voice heard. We are ready to sacrifice our short-term economic interest for the long-term welfare. Before I left, I met these climate activists with the local chapter of 350.org. Excuse me, is this the meeting for the march? Oh, yes. Hi, is it going to help you? Oh, right yes. Hello, yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Yeah. Ringo Hello. and Eddie. Yes, yes, you've come to the right place. Thank you. Yeah, yeah the Pride meeting. We are doing the preparation day. for tomorrow's parade. Oh. Tomorrow's a bomb parade. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah. <laughs> Ringo and Eddie are organizing a march using fake atomic bombs that represent the amount of heat trapped in the atmosphere by global warming, the equivalent of four Hiroshima bombs every second. Eddie is a former meteorologist, and Ringo worked for a toy company. They are united in their passion to fight climate change. We really want the young people to organize their own movement, own yes. action. Yeah. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Now, you know, I work on climate change in America, and sometimes it just seems kind of hopeless. How do you keep your spirits up? Because you're very <laughs> positive guys. Julius, <laughs> uh, I think the momentum is been building up gradually, gradually, yeah, gradually. gradually. Yeah. Okay? Yes. And we think this is the top priority of the world. Yes. Of course, as a man of science, right, uh, we look at the data, actually, I am on the pessimistic side. Uh, I have to be frank. Yeah. But as a human being, I'm always optimistic. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's the spirit. Yes. In the U.S., thanks in part to the Beyond Coal campaign, 242 plants have closed or will soon, but 281 remain. And the coal industry is fighting regulations at all levels of government. Here in Waukegan, NRG's new CEO still hasn't come to talk to the activists many months after he promised to do so. But Rita Mayfield and 26 other local and state representatives eventually signed the letter to the company. Mayor Motley did not, and the Waukeganites want to make that an issue in his upcoming re-election campaign. Dulce hasn't lost hope that Ivan will grow up in a Waukegan without coal. And she's found a part of herself she never knew existed. I can be an agent of change and say, this is wrong, this is what we need, and we need it now. And who's with me? Let's go. Have you ever even entertained the idea of how nice it would be to just give up the fight? Never. We have the right to clean air and clean water, and we shouldn't even be fighting about it, you know? Why, why is this such a struggle? The fight against climate change and the transition to cleaner energy is messy and difficult. But there's so much to be hopeful about. Ordinary people, like those in Waukegan, are doing what they can to take on climate change in their corner of the world. I'm reminded of an ancient Chinese proverb that says, be not afraid of growing slowly 
be afraid only of standing still. For now, at least, the U.S. and China are moving together. But if President-elect Trump has his way, he is likely to undo this hard-won partnership with the Chinese. Once again, we could be standing still on a melting planet. Are we really going to let that happen? <laughs>